Hello everyone, and welcome to my General Hospital YouTube channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribers button and give this video a thumbs up Molly and Cristino were welcomed at Alexis' home. She thanked them all for taking time out of their mornings and invited her daughters to join her. Molly admitted that she thought they'd been summoned to the principal's office, but Alexis reassured both Molly and Christina that they weren't in any trouble. However, Alexis stressed that it was critical that her daughters make their commitment to surrogacy legally binding, because Christina could not sign a contractual agreement that would legally make the unborn child Molly's. Because New York only acknowledged surrogacy when the egg donor was a third party, Alexis emphasized that the state's Child Parent Security Act was new and could easily be contested. Christina questioned whether that would make a difference, and Molly agreed that it would. There is a significant difference, Molly stated, because Christina would be both the surrogate and the egg donor. Alexis disclosed that a surrogacy contract would be unenforceable in New York. Christina felt convinced that she and Molly could find a way to work around the problem, but Alexis disagreed. Christina became enraged and accused her mother of attempting to protect Molly from her, but Alexis argued that she was only looking out for everyone's best interests. Alexis grabbed a file containing studies she'd conducted on the subject, but Molly and Christina were uninterested in hearing any of it. Alexis stated that she was only trying to help them prevent future problems, but Christina cut her off and reminded her that Molly was a lawyer, not Alexis. Alexis was taken aback, but she admitted Christina was correct. Christina apologized right away for rejecting Alexis' legal expertise and worries. Molly confessed that her surrogacy experience had been hopeful, and she had implicit faith in her sister. The bond between Chrissy and me is stronger than all the legal protections in the world, she said. We're sisters, Christina clarified. Christina pledged that nothing would ever be able to make Molly and her forget. Alexis backed down since it was evident that their faith in each other outweighed hers. Alexis agreed not to say anything else about it, and she told her daughters that she had complete faith in them. Alexis also commended Molly and Christina for standing up for one another. Molly and Christina left arm in arm and smiling after they came around for a group embrace. Brooklyn was late for work and hurriedly trying to grab her belongings at Chase and Brooklyn's apartment. Chase sat quietly on the sofa, telling Brooke Lynn where to find everything and holding up a thermos of freshly prepared coffee for her. Brooke Lynn, grateful, took a moment to thank him and inquire about his plans for his day off. When he mentioned that he was looking for a wedding site that could accept impaired visitors like his father, since he wanted Gregory to have the time of his life at their wedding, her smile faded. Brooke Lynn sat down next to Chase on the sofa, closing his laptop. She remembered Gregory telling her that his Christmas desire was to live long enough to see Chase marry the love of his life, but she pushed the thought aside and carefully informed Chase that their wedding would have to take place sooner than expected. Chase reminded her that they had discussed a summer wedding and that he didn't want to rush her into a hasty wedding. He reminded her about his catastrophic wedding to Willow, but Brooke Lynn insisted that their circumstances were different. Chase indicated that his wedding to Brooke Lynn would be his final, and he wanted it to be memorable. He asked her to tell him what was really going on since he suspected she was hiking something. Brooke Lynn told him about her hospital conversation with Gregory. Chase was alarmed and worried if his father knew something they didn't, so Brooke Lynn volunteered to call in and stay with Chase to work things out together. Chase told her that he was all right and sent her to her workplace, Finn then called Chase to inform him that Gregory was in the hospital. Finn entered an examining room at the hospital, where he discovered Gregory splayed out on an exam table and connected up to an IV. Gregory reassured his son that he was all right, but Finn was curious as to what had transpired. Gregory minimized the situation, claiming that he'd simply overheated while doing hot yoga. Finn suspected his father was lying since patients who became hot were not given fluids. A doctor called Matt entered the room and greeted Finn. Matt requested Finn to wait in the corridor while he examined Gregory after they exchanged greetings and polite talk. 
Matt checked Gregory's vital signs after Finn left and found them to be normal. Gregory informed the doctor that he was feeling better, much to Matt's delight. He did, however, advise Gregory that he wanted to admit him for observation and testing, because his fall may have been caused by dehydration or a new indication of the disease. Gregory was displeased, but he agreed to stay only one night, because Gregory had plans for New Year's Eve. A young woman approached Finn in the corridor and inquired about Gregory. The young lady introduced herself as a yoga instructor, and she stated that the situation in her class was significantly more serious than Gregory had suggested. Chase arrived at the hospital a little time later and approached his brother. Finn informed Chase of what had occurred, as well as his talk with the yoga instructor. Chase pointed out that the yoga instructor wasn't a doctor, and he suggested that they put their trust in Gregory if he didn't appear concerned about the dizziness. Matt had just went out to get Finn and Chase. Gregory was irritated when he saw Chase because he didn't want his son to be worried unnecessarily. Gregory asserted that he was all right, but he added that he was only staying for the night. Chase told Matt to look after his father, since Gregory had promised Chase's wife a dance at their upcoming wedding in the spring. Gregory brightened up when he heard the news. Gregory inquired about the wedding date after Matt had left. Chase claimed that he and Brooke Lynn didn't want to wait to make their relationship official, so they planned a spring wedding. Gregory was overjoyed. Lucy and Tracy were tense at deception as they waited for Brooke Lynn and Sasha to arrive for a meeting. When Lucy and Tracy started trading barbs, Maxie tried to mediate, but things quickly deteriorated. Tracy flaunted her ownership of deception in Lucy's face, and Lucy accused Tracy of trying to distract herself from the truth that Tracy had nothing left to live for since Luke's death. Don't ever mention Luke's name again, Tracy advised. Lucy, utterly shameless, asserted that Tracy was only one of Luke's many, many women. You barely cracked the top ten, Lucy added. Maxie warned Lucy not to go there, but Lucy persisted. Lucy argued that Laura, not Tracy, was Luke's true love, and that Tracy was a also rand for Holly Sutton. Tracy turned the tables on Lucy by reminding her that Kevin, her true love, was married to Laura. Lucy's voice broke up with emotion as she insisted on her love for Martin, pointing out that Tracy and Luke hadn't even been in the same country when Luke died. Lucy asked to know why Tracy had opted to take deception, implying that Tracy had more to look back on than forward to, because Tracy's family barely tolerated her. Brooke Lynn entered as Lucy informed Tracy that she would die unloved and completely unlovable. Brooke Lynn was enraged and accused Lucy of being jealous, since Tracy ran deception better than Lucy had. Brooke Lynn also insisted that Lucy was misinformed because Tracy was loved by her family, but Lucy couldn't see it because she was a gold-digging outsider who had trapped Alan Quatermain into marriage for 10 seconds and spent years trading on her single share of ELQ, which Tracy had gotten back. You're now out on the street, exactly where you belong, Brooke Lynn explained. Lucy began to respond, but Brooke Lynn interrupted her by reminding her that Tracy had stuck by the man she loved, but Lucy had flung hers away with both hands. Lucy, shaken, indicated that the meeting might go ahead without her. Tracy silently thanked Brooke Lynn for her defense after Lucy had left. She swiftly returned to business, demanding to know why her granddaughter was late. Brooke Lynn's grandmother's tone softened when she told Tracy that Gregory had been admitted to the hospital. Tracy accepted the explanation, but she told Brooke Lynn to follow Tracy's lead and act like a leader if she was serious about running deception. Tracy was told by Brooke Lynn that she was. Sasha stopped into the quarter main stables to alert Cody of Felicia's suspicions that he had lied about the DNA test. Cody didn't seem concerned, since he thought it was reasonable for a private investigator married to a cop to be suspicious of everything. But Sasha cautioned him to take it seriously, because they'd both understood Felicia was right to be skeptical because he had lied. And now, Felicia is wondering why you would pretend to be the son of Leopold Tov, she said. Cody argued that Mac was a nice person who deserved better than to be his son. Sasha protested, but cautioned him that Felicia would keep digging until she found the answers she sought. The fallout from that could be massive, 
Sasha predicted. She emphasized that she was speaking from personal experience. The topic momentarily shifted to Valentin hiring Sasha to pose as Nana's daughter, and how Sasha could have avoided a lot of trouble if she'd just been honest sooner. Sasha stated that her silence had exacerbated the situation. Cody emphasized that he did not believe in honesty. If Felicia finds out that I'm Mac's son, I'm going to Pentonville, he added. Sasha was skeptical that Mac would arrest Cody, but Cody contended that Mac wouldn't have a choice because of the lawsuit Scott had concocted. Sasha was perplexed because Cody had told her that he'd dropped the lawsuit to reclaim the tolled necklace from the WSB. Cody verified this, but he had also given a deposition and signed an affidavit claiming to be Leo Tobb's son, so he might face jail time for perjury. Cody refused to risk Mac's reputation with the Port Charles Police Department being harmed by the scandal of his arrest. What do you think Mac would want for your life if he knew that he was your father? Sasha inquired. She was confident Mac would forgive Cody. Cody informed her that Robert wasn't a fan of his, but Sasha argued that it was because Robert hadn't seen Cody's transformation or his connections with Mac and James. Cody appreciated her pledge to support him in any case. Scott greeted Beth behind the counter at Kelly's and declared his intention to eat his feelings away. Beth smiled and brought him a menu, but he returned it and requested that she bring him everything on the left side of the menu as well as a cup of coffee. Scott then went over to his table to wait for his hefty order. Felicia told Robert that she had invited him to meet her for breakfast because they needed to address a family situation and she wanted his aid to solve a mystery before Mac returned from his trip. Robert was fascinated until Felicia disclosed her suspicions that Kobe had lied about the DNA test findings. Robert accused Cody of deception and argued that Mac would have been better off if Cody had decided to lie about the results. Felicia was adamantly opposed. Cody had grown close to their family, she added, and there was a special link between Cody, Mac, and James. Robert questioned why Cody would lie about the DNA findings if he had grown to care about Mac's family. Felicia acknowledged that it didn't make sense, but she was confident that Robert could help her figure it out. Robert persuaded Felicia to discontinue it, but she was adamant that she would not. Frustrated, Robert stated that he'd never liked Cody because he'd always suspected him of being a swindler. He reminded Felicia of Cody's early days in Port Charles and told her about an argument he had overheard between Britt and Cody regarding who was rightful owner of Leo Tobb's Ice Princess jewelry. Felicia was curious if Cody had ever claimed Tobb's other assets. Robert didn't respond, but his gaze was drawn to Scott. Felicia grinned as she followed his line of sight. Felicia walked over to Scott's table and sat down. She started a conversation by asking about Liesel and listened sympathetically as he moaned that Liesel had rejected his last attempt to reconcile, therefore he was done trying. She eventually directed the topic to Cody, but Scott's mood remained unchanged. He cost me a big payday, Scott grumbled. Scott informed Felicia about Cody's lawsuit to recover Todd's priceless necklace and Cody's decision to withdraw. Felicia recognized Cody stood to make a fortune if the lawsuit was successful. Scott was perplexed as to why Felicia had inquired about Cody, but she immediately excused herself and returned to her seat. Felicia told Robert that she needed to hurry to the office and that she was more convinced than ever that Cody had lied about the DNA findings. Robert questioned whether Mac needed to know about Cody if Cody chose to lie, but Felicia insisted that Mac had a right to know that Cody was his son. Meanwhile, Lucy stepped in and immediately went to Scott's table. She triumphantly assured him that she had discovered a method for both of them to win. Scott remarked that it was physically impossible, but Lucy was not amused. She claimed that she had a strategy that would restore what she had lost, while also earning Scott a large sum of money. I'm listening, Scott declared. Lucy guaranteed that she and Scott would win big in 2024, while Tracy would lose. Scott was curious as to how he fit in. As a groom, Lucy replied. Lucy explained that after Scott married Tracy, she and Scott would steal all Tracy owned. 
Thanks for watching if you like this video. So please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and don't miss any updates.